a victory by even one vote would be a victory. So I'm happy to win. Um, you know, but in 1971, when I first campaigned as an eight-year-old child, my um, went door to door with the pamphlets for my uncle. In that era, he won with some two lakh uh, plus margin. I'd love to repeat something like that. You know, our ancestors have gifted us a beautiful system of lakes. You should look at my parliamentary track record. Okay. Well, I've been a very active and successful a former Rajya Sabha member yeah, yeah, as well. And yeah. for the viewers also, those uh, who do not know, he's been a Rajya Sabha member as well. Attendance with over 90 percent, I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah 90 percent taking part in over, uh, you know, answered 693 questions. Posed, and, uh, posed 693. Posed 693 questions, three members bill, 93 percent attendance, and 693 questions is uh, what you have posed. Today we are on the campaign trial of uh, Professor M. V. Rajiv Gowda who is uh, the candidate for the Congress party from the Bengaluru North Lok Sabha constituency. First and foremost, thank you for joining the uh, Republic. You know, I was going through your profile and reading most of it, uh, but uh, what people also don't understand is the various designations that you have held over the years <laughs> as well. And uh, one thing which was very interesting, Director of RBI. Right. Uh, so, how was this particular experience for you and from the director of RBI, a transition into politics. So what is this journey being on? Well, first, I'm born into a family of freedom fighters and politicians. So politics is not new to me. Politics is something that I have been brought up in a very inspiring environment of freedom fighters. My uncle was elected to the Lok Sabha six times, Mr. M. B. Krishnappa. Yeah. He's the founder of the dairy cooperative movement in Karnataka. Mm -hmm. What Korean is to Gujarat, Mr. M. B. Krishnappa is to Karnataka. Mm -hmm. So as a result, I've seen how good leadership can make a huge difference provide livelihoods to lakhs and crores of people. Mm -hmm. So I've grown up in that kind of an environment. My father and we went up as speaker of the assembly mm -hmm. amongst other things. So I grew up wanting to study public policy and economics and harness that knowledge for the benefit of India, mm -hmm. which is what I've done. Mm -hmm. And so this is all part of a long-term plan, mm -hmm. which luckily for me has been unfolding a little slowly, mm -hmm. but certainly successfully. Mm -hmm. And so part of the journey mm -hmm. was when I returned Returned to India and joined the Indian Institute of Management, Bangalore, yeah. as a professor, uh, as the head of the public policy department later on. Mm -hmm. Basically, I got a chance to work with policymakers and yeah. to provide inputs on various things, including. That inspired you to come to politics, policy making? Policy making, I told you about the inspiration comes from the, the family. family background, yeah. yeah? Yeah, but policy making, obviously, if I have this expertise, I want to bring that expertise to you, you make use of that expertise, mm -hmm. right? So then uh, the UPA government appointed me director of the Central Board of the Reserve Bank of India. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this is the board that oversees monetary policy, oversees, um, you know, growth triggers, various things like that, makes sure the banking system is secure. Mm -hmm. and and um, one of the best, you know, in, in, uh, you know, experiences because we gain uh, insights into how to manage the economy from one dimension of it. Okay, mm -hmm. and I worked with governors like uh, Subarao and Raghuram Rajan, who is yeah. an old friend of mine from my college days. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we used to quiz against each other actually. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. in college. Yeah. You know, now looking at this entire complexity of how Bengaluru North is. By far, it has the highest number of voters across the entire state of Karnataka. 33 lakhs and change. 31. Hmm. Yeah, 31. And the recent registration has gone up by 2.5 lakhs. So oh. the latest database, according to the Election Commission of India, is 33 lakhs. So we have the highest number of voters in the Bengaluru North Lok Sabha constituency. The previous highest was Bengaluru Rural. But now we are having North surpassing that highest registration of voters as well. Uh, looking at it, they say that this is a completely urban belt. But I don't agree to it. We also have pockets of rural areas as well. Yeah. How do you bridge this urban and rural divide as well? And how do you connect with the voters? Because the way of approaching them would be completely different. Right. So so it's an urbanizing seat, substantially urban seat. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. But there are huge rural pockets. Mm -hmm. Okay. There's a lot of unplanned development that happens in rural pockets, yeah. what we call revenue layouts and things like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, as a result, infrastructure challenges remain, uh, basic issues like transport and water and sewage management, waste management, all of those become problems because they have not been addressed 
going for, you know, ahead of time, right? So, so this is where the growth in this in um, the Bengaluru is happening. Bengaluru North is the new Bengaluru. Yeah. Okay. So, what I bring to the table is a certain vision and understanding of how we can reshape development, okay. right? So, basically, there's a concept of 15-minute cities, where if uh, if if you you know nowadays, what's the uh, plan? You just allow huge urban sprawl, yeah. all these 30, 40, 20, 30 sites, mm -hmm. and um, and from you know it makes it difficult to provide public transport. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's uh, commercial is far away from the residential. So we have to think about more denser, you know, tightly knit communities. We need planned communities. Yes. Planned communities, we haven't had planned uh, development in Karnataka, in Bengaluru for a couple of decades now yeah. because um, the master plan has not been renewed. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so this 15 minute city concept mm -hmm. is where everything should be accessible to you. Education, entertainment, uh, work, um, uh, you know, food, all that sort of thing. Shopping, sports facilities, cultural facilities within a 15 minute walk from where you live. Okay. So if we start thinking along those lines, mm -hmm. then the amount amount of burden that we put on the over transport infrastructure, everyone yeah. crossing the city to go wherever they need to, etc., mm -hmm. a lot of that can come down, right? Yeah. So, so those are um, examples of how we can fix that. Mm -hmm. On uh, water-related issues, right. you know, our ancestors have gifted us a beautiful system of lakes, mm -hmm. man-made yeah. lakes, yeah. that connect to one another Absolutely. and where water is harvested and, and flows through overflow. Okay, so, so basically, um, that system we keep destroying. Mm. We need to restore that. Mm. We need to also ensure that with all this land getting paved by housing and uh, roads, we need to find ways to recharge groundwater through yeah. rainwater harvesting and other methods. We get enough rain here. Mm. We don't have to. What well, Bangalore's water is amongst the most expensive in the world. We why, pump it why from are the Kaveri. Such a huge, uh, you know, scarcity, lack of water. Because yes, summer. This has been like the harshest summer in the last 125 yeah. years. They say. But what do you think will need to be done to solve the problems on a war footing short term as well as long term yeah, yeah. so short term we need to find ways to dig bore wells and get water mm -hmm. uh, prevent um, you know the tanker mafia from That's extorting right. people make sure that water is available to everyone not just the rich right mm -hmm. that's a short term measure yeah. but the longer term measure not even longer term it's where you know when the rains come we need to harvest it we need to recharge the groundwater in the shallow mm -hmm. aquifers mm -hmm. we need to find ways to you know slow down the runoff mm -hmm. all sorts of things are possible right. they just need to be implemented fairly urgently mm -hmm. one of the reasons though for the problem is that some of our biggest lakes mm -hmm. which um, uh, you know Belandur, Jakur etc mm -hmm. uh, Kingeri these are all lakes that have been um, you know drained to allow for desilting mm -hmm. but the previous BJP government just took their time mm -hmm. and so that project uh, process is not finished mm -hmm. and now when we finish it quickly now when the the rains come, we'll be in a position to, um, uh, you know, to basically recharge the groundwater and make life simpler. Mm. But at this moment, mm. without um, water being water. there, yeah. there's nothing that's seeping in and that's, that's a big problem. Do yeah. you think that the governments across party lines successfully have failed in going ahead and uh, preserving mother nature as well as our lakes because you know Bengaluru is basically called as the land of lakes mm -hmm. between anywhere between 2000 to 2005 mm -hmm. we had around 250 lakes to be sure and today we are seeing that depleted to around 111 and out of the 111 around 50 to 60 are almost on the verge of extinction today it's almost been half to so do you think that the policies which has been done by the successive governments has failed in going ahead and preserving our lakes? Yeah they were very short sighted policies they were uh, they, anytime they saw a lake, they would figure out what can we do in this place. So, Kempegoda bus stand is in the old Dharmam Budikere. Mm. We have uh, Karnataka Golf Association golf course on Chalagata Lake. Mm. You know, these sorts of things. Some, you know, ST bed, yeah. which floods every time it rains, mm. it stands for Sinivagalu tank bed. You, you know, you built a, a, a layout on the tank bed. Where will the water flow? Into that, uh, into those houses. Because that's how historically it's been. Mm. But now, 
we need some new scientific assessment because mm. um, water flows have changed. Mm. We need to figure out how to prevent those water flows from, you know, from ca causing floods. And we need to make sure that we can um, find a way to get it back underground, mm. right? All of those are key issues. You know, in Bengaluru North, shifting our focus to, you know, more largely centered around politics now. Uh, you know, Bengaluru North has seen a union minister, Mr. D.V. Sadananda Gowda has been there. Uh, he's taken part in discussions, he's brought projects as well as what they say. Looking at his and analyzing his performance card, there were 585 debates which was conducted in the past five years in terms of policy making as well as discussions which was held in the parliament. His uh, attendance is somewhere anywhere between 67 to 71 percent. But then the rate of conversation that he's had is he's participated only in seven of them. There has been zero questions so far by him. So how do you rate this performance of him? Because he's no longer contesting now. Yet another union minister has come in. And why should the people vote for Mr. Rajiv Gowda over a sitting union minister in the form of Shobha Kanandaji? Looking that her predecessor has not done good work or is the fact that Mr. Rajiv Gowda is going to bring about change? Yeah, so basically, uh, you should look at my parliamentary track record. Absolutely. Okay? Well, yeah. I've been a very active and successful... He's a former Rajya Sabha member yeah, yeah, as well. And yeah. for the viewers also, those uh, who do not know, he's been a Rajya Sabha member as well. Attendance with over 90%, I yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah than 90%. Taking part in over, uh, you know, answered 693 questions. Posed, and, uh, posed 693. Posed 693 questions, three members bill, 93% attendance. And 693 questions is uh, what you have posed don't know whether you have been able to get the response or not. Oh, no, 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 no. In fact, the Raphael scandal, we unheard through one of my questions. Mm. So I've been a, a parliamentarian mm. who the other side also respects because um, there, there's been a time when they've changed, set up a committee to change a law mm. after my speech mm. because I had some very strong constructive criticism, constructive mm. criticisms. Mm. So if you were to ask um, the top leadership of the country, mm -hmm. they will say we respect uh, Professor Gowda's uh, contributions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyway, the basic point is that um, uh, you know the BJP themselves changed their candidate, yeah. uh, possibly on the basis of lack of performance. Mm. But who have they given us? They've given us another candidate from, a, from imported from this time, Udupi Chikmagalur, mm. who was chased away by her own party people mm. with "Go Back Shoba" slogans. And she says okay. that it was a vendetta campaign against her. Well, you know, why would people have a vendetta unless you've done something to provoke it, mm. right? Mm. Okay, I, I mean, we are all colleagues, we're all friends, yeah. I have nothing against her personally, mm. but clearly that uh, groundswell of opposition from the BJP workers mm. saying go back Shobha yeah. indicates that she had not performed there. Mm. That she had not responded to her own party workers. Mm. And now they've sent her here, mm. right? Somebody who has had that kind of a track record, mm -hmm. so that's not what Bengaluru North re needs right now. Mm. Bengaluru North needs someone like me, who's a local, who's seen the city evolving, who's seen the challenges emerging, who also has the passion to fix all this, the expertise to bring in you know, the best ideas possible to apply them as the city develops. And um, you know, so, so that's really what I bring to the table. So tremendous contrast. Shubha Karanlaji is not somebody new to Bengaluru North. She was also the former MLA as well as a minister from the Yashwanpur Assembly constituency in 2008 under Mr. Mm -hmm. B.S. Yadirapa's government. So she says, this is not something very new for me. Uh, and mm -hmm. also, Professor Rajiv Gowda is somebody who sits in the back room, he's a brain behind things, he organizes, he orchestrates and does this. But how will this be different to coming ahead, coming in front of the people? Won't this be a challenge for you? Because there have always been somebody who is who's very laid back. Uh, no, 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 no. Who uh, has vision, but who's laid back, yeah? No, no, who's been working in the back room, I agree, because that's yeah. been the responsibility as Absolutely. head of the head of the research department of the and, Congress, and that's very as important. head of the think tank. Mm. See, I do my job. Mm. If my job is to provide inputs to my Congress colleagues in Parliament, mm. if my job is to prepare documents that show the BJP's failures, mm -hmm. if the job is to prepare the party's manifesto, I sit mm -hmm. and do that. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. a Lok Sabha MP's job is different. And yeah. whatever the job description calls for, I will absolutely engage it, mm -hmm. right? So there, think about it. You're meeting me. 
am I some you know backroom guy or am I person am I a person who everyone can interact with who people can uh, you know be very affectionate towards I can uh, connect with you exactly and so will everyone else wherever mm. I go that's the kind of connect I'm getting mm. when you're in the Rajya Sabha you're not in the midst of the people that's mm. the nature of the job mm. uh, when you are you know but I have been working with youth I have been working you know we've done numerous kinds of campaigns on the ground etc so there's no question of um, you know of being some backroom guy you know I'm happily engaged in these are all my people these are the people I grew up with these are the people I've played cricket with on the fields these are the people with whom I've gone double riding on a bicycle so there's no issue at all I mean I'm very happy to be amidst the masses and I'm unlike uh, you know the, uh, my opponent who seems to have uh, her own people disliking her I don't anticipate that at all. I'm getting very, very positive responses from the public. It has eight assembly constituencies now in Bengaluru North. Five of them are there with the BJP, three of them are there with the Congress. So how do you think that the votes will tilt in your favor? So uh, it turns out that one of the large assembly segments, mm -hmm. the BJP MLA, has um, uh, announced that he's going to support me. Absolutely coming. Okay. To and um, uh, in another large assembly segment, mm -hmm. you have uh, the previous JDS MLA who's joined us. Mm -hmm. Large number of BJP corporators. Saying Dasrali. Dasrali, yeah. Mm -hmm. The first is Yashwantpur, next yeah, is yeah. Dasrali. Yeah, Yashwantpur, next is Yashwantpur from the BJP. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then a large number of corporators mm -hmm. who were elected by the BJ from the BJP have joined us. There's a groundswell of support that's right. picking up. You know, basically people are also looking at the contrast between the candidates. You know, mm. uh, Shobaka has a longer history than I do, mm. but um, people ask. She keeps changing constituencies. Yeah. Why is that? Mm. You know, is she ever delivered or she just runs away? Mm. You know, people are asking, where are you going to next? Uh, that sort of question. Isn't her. that okay? Isn't that fine with you that, you know, a person shifts from one constituency to the other? No, no, no. Why should you shift if you've done such good work? Mm. Then the people should re-elect you with a huge margin, right? Okay. If, uh, by moving away from one constituency to another, by facing go-back slogans, it indicates to us that this is a person who gets elected and then does nothing. Now, remember... All these people also, in Karnataka, we elected 25 BJP MPs. Um, and all of them campaigned in the name of the Prime Minister. They said, don't vote for me, vote for, the, uh, vote for Mr. Modi. Right? Now, Karnataka doesn't need dummy MPs. We need people who can raise the vo their voices in, raise the voice of Karnataka in Parliament. Mm -hmm. Okay, when the central government, BJP government, has been, you know, doing variety of injustice to Karnataka, none of these people have ever done anything at all to even question the central government. In fact, mm -hmm. the finance minister who is elected from here mm -hmm. has gone ahead and continuously declined the opportunity to give us what is our due. All right. So we, we don't want devolution. tax devolution. Tax devolution. There are budgetary fund, drought relief fund, finance commission mm -hmm. um, recommendations, and things that have been announced in previous budgets. For example, funds for the Upper Bradhara project. All right. Mm -hmm. So it's all they just talk and they don't deliver. Enough of that. I think people are uh, sick and tired of uh, dummy MPs who don't deliver. You know, I'll I'll just come back to you. Uh, let's revisit your statement saying that you know. Uh, Shubha Karanlaje has been sent away from her constituency, constituencies after constituency, she's gone on to change as well. But that also reminds a similar case when it comes to the Congress party as well. If you look at Rahul Gandhi, he was defeated in Amethi. He is now going ahead and contesting in uh, Why Not. Uh, doesn't the same also apply for Mr. Gandhi? Mr. Gandhi wants to represent, you know, he has support across the nation, mm -hmm. right? Mr. Modi is from Gujarat. Mm. He contested from Baroda, Baroda and uh, Varanasi. Yeah. And then he chose to stay on in Varanasi. Mm. Similarly, Mr. Gandhi chose to contest from different parts of India, Amethi and Vainad. Mm. Uh, he won from Vainad mm. and so he's happily con uh, you know, contributing there and he's continuing to contest from there. Mm. You know, continuing our conversation uh, with uh, the Bengaluru North uh, candidate, uh, Professor M.V. Rajiv Gowda, 
uh, you know, we left it off uh, with uh, that uh, go back uh, campaign that you were speaking about, uh, uh, Shobha Karanlaje as well. But now, considering the fact uh, that uh, Mr. S. T. Somshekar, who is supposed to be a vital cog in the Bengaluru North Lok Sabha constituency, because Yashwanpur being one of the constituencies which has the largest number of voters in this segment and also the second largest number of voters across the entire city of Bengaluru after Mahadev Pura. How important do you think that S.T. Somshekar, despite being in the BJP, supporting you as a candidate, we also saw that in the campaigns which he was doing yesterday and he was also addressing the workers. How important do you think that is for you? It's very, very important. First, every vote is important. Mm. Everyone who's shouting go back slogans in Bengaluru North mm. against their uh, BJP candidate, mm. I welcome their votes as well. Mm. Because, you know, what matters is that the right candidate wins. Mm. Now, uh, Somshekar, you know, uh, Yashwantpur is a huge constituency Absolutely. and uh, his coming adds a lot of strength to the Congress, mm. uh, to my candidacy. Mm. And, um, I, you know, and he's an old congressman, so I'm very happy to welcome him back. Mm. And, uh, um, fundamentally, it also gives us an opportunity to reach out. You know, he has a very good um, organization mm. to reach out to every village. This is the part of the rural urbanizing Bengaluru is substantially in Yashwantpur, mm. right? Mm. And, um, and and to work on uh, the sustainable growth of Bengaluru, Yashwantpur is very important. So it's good to have the cooperation of the MLA uh, and uh, an opportunity to work with the people, understand their mm. concerns and solve them. Uh, mm. You know, S.T. Somshekar coming over is absolutely working wonders for you. But do you think that as a politician being from one party, it is ethical to go ahead and support a member of the other party? See, I, 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 I paid attention to what he said in his speech at that event. And uh, he basically said that the BJP candidate for the Lok Sabha has not approached him, a sitting BJP MLA, mm. and asked him to campaign for her. Mm. So then he apparently called this workers' meeting to ask the workers, the, uh, all his supporters, what he should do. And it seems like the overwhelming uh, desire of the workers mm. is that there is a better candidate here, Professor Rajiv Gauda, mm. and that they should, uh, they urged him to campaign for me mm. instead of uh, their official candidate. So it's, you know, it's also ethical to pay attention to the voice mm. of your, uh, your people. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor, who else apart from Mr. S.T. Somshekar is now going ahead and, you know, uh, supporting you in your campaigning as uh, well? Because uh, it will be of a notable uh, fact uh, that, uh, you know, it is very important to go ahead and also garner grassroots uh, support for yourself. You have got S.T. Somshekar, so it looks more like a four is to four when it comes to the assembly constituencies. Mm -hmm. But who else is uh, coming in tow along with him? So, so uh, separately, mm -hmm. in Dasrali, mm -hmm. which is also held by the BJP, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the person who came second this time yeah. by a 10,000 vote margin yeah. is um, uh, Mr. Manjuna. Manjuna. He was yeah. previously the JDS MLA. Right. He has joined us. Okay. Okay? okay. So I would, uh, between his vote base mm. and the Congress vote base, mm. I can assure you that we will get a lead in Dasrali. Mm. So lead in Yashwantpur, lead in Dasrali. Mm. Our three uh, MLAs, mm. uh, the ministers, mm. Vyatra and Pura, Krishna Baregauda, Hebbal, Bharati Suresh, and uh, Pulakesh Nagar MLA, yeah. AC Srinivas, yeah. that are very powerful very strong base mm. and KR Pura again a very large seat yeah. you have uh, Mohan Babu our last candidate mm. uh, really continue to work on mm. a night and day basis mm. <coughs> in the process mm. we have repaired that deficit Mm. And a lot of BJP corporators from that area mm. have come and joined us. Mm. So even that place is a, is a Kyarpuram is where I expect to lead okay. with this kind of groundswell, mm. with this kind of support for my candidacy. I think the momentum is right. Okay, I am. I am. It's just that okay. uh, too many speeches. Uh, uh, you know, uh, essentially what Professor Rajiv Gauda was mentioning here for the benefit of our viewers as well uh, is the fact uh, that uh, the BJP MLA from uh, Yashwantpur, S.T. Somshekar, has uh, essentially gone ahead and uh, lent uh, his uh, support to Professor Rajiv Gauda as uh, well as uh, Mr. Manjunath, who was a former MLA from uh, the JDS, from the, uh, you know, from the Dastali Lok Sabha constituency, uh, from the Assembly constituency. And uh, more of now, how important do you think that the caste equation or the caste factor is. We have been seeing you 
going ahead and visiting the mats. We saw Mr. D.K. Shukumar, in fact, taking all the candidates to Jagadguru Nirvanananda Swamiji of the Adi Chinchingiri Mat as well. So how important do you think that it will be? Because mats usually don't take a political side as well. So how important do you think that the caste equation will be here? 53%, 53% of the votes from the constituency of Bengaluru North has Vokkalega population. No, 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 no. Your numbers are a little on the higher side. Uh -huh. It's a much more diverse uh, population. Okay. But uh, the si one of the most significant communities is yeah. my Wakriga mm. uh, community. Mm. And um, so we went to the Mutt to mm. seek the blessings of our Swamiji. Mm. And so he gave us guidance on how we should, uh, uh, you know, develop the constituency once we win. Mm. And um, basically, you know, what... Both the main candidates, uh, Shobaka and I, are Wakaligas. Mm. Uh, Shobaka is from uh, Ma Manglo side. Yeah. I'm a local. I'm, I'm born and brought up here. My roots are, father's roots are in Kola district. My yeah. mothers are in Bengaluru. Mm. And so we already have a very large number. You know, we don't think of it as a caste business. Mm. I think of it as my extended family, mm. which is very large across this constituency. Mm. And my late uncle, Amy Krishna, used to represent this constituency, mm. 67 to 77. Right. So he's been uh, elected from here as well. So a lot of people who remember his contributions, uh, the schools he set up, the tanks that he built, you know, and wherever I go, you know, older people uh, remember. And uh, I'm uh, very happy to see that there's someone carrying the flag uh, even at this point. Anyway, the, the point is that uh, you know, people are going to say, look, he's one of us, mm. he's a local, right. he's part of the larger family. Mm. And so I, if this equation were to bring in a caste or community angle, right. I would expect it to favor me. Favor you. However, mm. just like a good congressman, uh, my ideology doesn't necessarily make me prefer one community over the other. Mm. Our approach is inclusive. Mm. So we will make sure that every community has a chance to come together and prosper. Okay. Most importantly, our emphasis is on unity in diversity, on celebrating mm. the diversity that we have here. Sarva Janangada Shanti, Shanti Atota. Mm. What did the BJP the candidates... Shanti. Yeah, peace. What did the BJP candidates do at the moment the election was announced? All three of them have an FIR against them for trying to incite a riot in Nagarthpet, mm. right? Mm. So when you don't have anything else as a track record to show, mm. what do you do? The usual. Try but and light a fire. What happened to fire. Is right? I'm not getting into what happened there. There are ways of dealing with these mm. issues which mm. do not involve trying to create a communal incident. Mm. But the BJP and its candidates have no qualms, no hesitation mm. in trying to turn everything into a Hindu-Muslim issue. That is something that we will not allow to happen. Okay. Mm. Uh, you know, lastly, going ahead, the Congress also uh, has gone ahead and uh, released its manifesto, which it uh, calls as the Nyai Patra as well. Mm -hmm. uh, there are a few topics which the Congress has mentioned, first and foremost about the central agencies. They have stated that they will be looking into several provisions of the Prevention of Money Laundering Act and they will try to bring about changes first. Secondly, they have also now gone ahead and stated that several cases like the Rafal deal, the Pegasus will also be brought to the forefront as well. But if you look at the Rafal deal, the Supreme Court has already cleared it. Why does the Congress want to rake up this issue again? You go back to the Rafael uh, procurement process. Because you also questioned about it as well. Yeah, yeah. So it was a question of mine in mm -hmm. Parliament where we asked, um, you know, what's the price of the you know, Rafael jet? And the then Defence Minister Nirmala Sitaraman responded by saying it's a secret. Mm -hmm. Now, defence purchases at a broad level, mm -hmm. there may be some aspects that are secret, but mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. the purchase price because we know what our government had negotiated mm -hmm. with, um, uh, you know, with, with the with the so, right? Yeah. And so, basically, what happened was mm -hmm. in that initial stage of exuberance, the Prime Minister had gone to France, broken every rule of defence procurement, mm -hmm. and so for whatever reason the Supreme Court chose to ignore that. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's all sealed cover justice and all that sort of thing. We don't know what evidence was uh, provided. Mm -hmm. Anyway. So you're saying what
what transpired is still kept in a shroud of secrecy. Yeah. There is no transparency. There. there has not. There have never been transparency mm. about mm. this. Mm. And uh, and uh, you know, and and the people who benefited from it, okay, were people like Anil Ambani, mm. who have had no track record in the aviation sector. Mm. Our uh, wonderful Hindustan Aeronautics in Bengaluru yeah. uh, was uh, sidelined mm. just to help uh, the cronies of the Prime Minister. Mm. So all of those are stories that are just one more example mm. of corruption that have uh, been part of this role that this regime. No, no, no. How come take electoral bonds. Supreme take court? electoral bonds. I'm, I'm coming to yeah. electoral bonds. Ah, that's I'm another example of an I'm unconstitutional thing. I'm coming yeah. to electoral bonds. How come the Supreme Court had cleared it? Why, why did the Supreme Court clear it? <laughs> we have not seen what is in the sealed envelope. What evidence was provided that allowed the Supreme Court to make that judgment? Mm. Right. So we'll look into these matters. Mm. We're not doing a witch hunt here. Pegasus. Pegasus. You know. Pegasus is something. Yeah. Pegasus. Every time uh, you know, I feel like I should look at my phone and say hello to the Home Minister if he's listening in. Uh, mm. I don't know what's going on. Right. Okay. This is not the way. Is what uh, was it selected targeting is what you are alleging when it of comes course. to Pegasus? Yeah. But then if you uh, if you look at the uh, people who are targeted. There were also union ministers targeted. Yeah. You know, there's a very suspicious uh, regime. Mm. And uh, but this is not the way to go about it. With mm. you know, surveillance also has to be done mm. under certain you know rules and regulations and, and frameworks when certain uh, approvals. Right. Not this kind of uh, surveillance that is aimed at um, political advantage. Mm. Right? Mm. That's mm. the real uh, challenge that we face here. Anyway, as I was mentioning about electoral bonds, bonds yeah. electoral bonds is a clear example mm. of massive corruption being hidden. Mm. by this government mm. okay mm. and luckily the supreme court in this case mm. has clearly laid out the logic uh, that the public needs to know who's mm. contributing to whom and therefore this anonymity should be made public, should be made public mm. right mm. so that's something that um, I'm happy to see. I was one of the first to oppose electoral bonds the mm. moment Mr. Jaitley introduced them in Parliament. Okay. Okay. I stood up and said this is not appropriate. Mm. And um, uh, you know, you, you, I've done quite a bit of work on electoral reform, so mm. I know what is appropriate and what's not. Mm. Anyway, so uh, the one other thing that I think you must pay attention to is the extraordinary injustice that the central government has done to Karnataka. I personally believe yeah. that you know I've been telling people that mm. a vote for the BJP means that you're anti-Karnataka. Okay. That is what is going on today. Mm. Because until the BJP central government makes amends, make sure that we get what is due to us, all right, uh, from the Finance Commission recommendation, from the Upper Badra project, which is announced in the budget for tax devolution, tax devolution make, that project. make that to project, mm. and the uh, this one, the drought relief funds. Mm. Mm. Until those things come, mm. this is a government, central government, that treats Karnataka in a very, very unfair manner, and therefore we well, should the reject BJP, the party. The the BJP outright. says every now and then that there was not a strong case which was put up in front of the 15th Finance Commission. That that, that has uh, been their single line reply to the sort of allegations that is coming in. Secondly, in terms of drought as well, uh, only the first tranche of funds should be allocated as of now. So the 18,371 crores which has been uh, you know sought by the government of Karnataka, they state that at least 4,000 crores should be released in the first tranche as well. They say that uh, we were about to release it but then the elections came in, the model code of conduct came in. That, 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 and what I, happens I, to the saying, people yes, suffering from drought? Keep them, uh, you know, suffering for another two, three months. Mm. Model code of conduct doesn't why, do anything like that. These are national the, emergencies. Why okay? are the funds late is what I'm saying. No, 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 no. Uh, every, in the month one second. Yeah. The BJP leaders are lying. Mm. We asked very much on time. Mm. If you ask which government was in power in Karnataka, which did not make a strong case before the Finance Commission, it was led by Mr. Yadurapa. Mm. So, you please look into those matters. Mm. The BJP has, uh, you know, they have not represented Karnataka properly mm. and it's time to reject them. Now, the other issue mm. about the Finance Commission, yeah. the Finance Minister is lying when she says the recommendation was in an interim report. Mm. There were two final reports, one yeah. for one year. Look at the terms of reference okay. and you'll see. The, because of the way it started, okay. they said do one immediately for one year mm. and do another for the remaining four years. Mm. Both are final reports. There's no question of interim and final. Mm. Okay. Okay? Mm. And the recommendation of the Finance Commission should have been uh, you know, implemented by the Finance Minister who said in Parliament that that's what she does, but you know, that's not what she has done mm. because it's Karnataka, the state she represents, and she does not want to give us what is our due. Okay. Mm. Uh, lastly, Professor, uh, we are looking at what is the sort of numbers that you are looking for the Congress party in the state of Karnataka out of the 28 Lok Sabha constituency? 
and uh, you are quite optimistic of your win as well what is the sort of margin that you are looking at was uh, you know to answer the second question first mm. a victory by even one vote would be a victory so mm. i'm happy to win mm. um you know but in 1971 when i first campaigned as an 8 year old child mm. my um, went door to door with the pamphlets from my uncle mm. in that era he won with some 2 lakh uh, plus margin i'd love to repeat something like that mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. and of course in terms of your first question yeah. i think um, out of 28 we are expecting um, more than 3/4 of the seats oh. okay? okay and let's see it's still early days Yes. Lastly, one particular statement which was made by Shobha Karanla ji in respect to the Rameshwaram uh, cafe blast as well has uh, basically triggered of uh, people to uh, from mm. uh, the neighboring state of uh, Tamil Nadu as uh, well. Are you looking to go ahead and cash on it because they state that this is something which the Congress will bring to the table as well because this shows what the person is. Yeah so the person is uh, famous for these controversial topics uh, statements for divisive statements why should you accuse people from Tamil Nadu of being terrorists mm. what is the logic of that mm. today the NIA national mm. investigative agency mm. has gone and arrested a BJP worker that for is that. absolutely wrong let me just clarify the national investigation agency has gone ahead and released the presser they held a briefing as well they stated that he is a witness he is not somebody who has oh, been arrested okay, okay. so that is the national investigation in agency's prerogative and they also mentioned that as he is a witness their identities had to be protected and this was basically done on some social thanks, media platform thanks for the clarification but the headline problem. and the story that i read mm -hmm. basically focused on the national uh, investigation BJP agency has, being involved in this the national investigation agency has uh, released uh, in fact uh, you know a clarification on that and stated that he is a witness in this particular case last but not the least uh, professor we are seeing some sort of uh, gali galoch politics that is taking place from both the parties from both the parties you know uh, with respect to women as well shobha karanla ji being a woman they have seen some anti women statements by the leaders of your party i am not going to revisit them as well will this work against you because you are contesting against the women boss, this is this second. is what shobha karanla ji yeah. is also going ahead and reiterating i am a woman so therefore i will again be voted into power because the congress party has it in its dna to go ahead and disrespect the women absolute nonsense we have been led by indira gandhi and sonia gandhi mm. extremely powerful and capable women who inspired Mm. but more importantly mm. apart from being a woman mm. you know i can't play that card but what card i can play if you're mentioning uh, that issue mm. is that i have a long track record mm. of working with and for mm. the improvement of women and the empowerment of women mm. i've grown up with amazing uh, you know women you've met my wife and daughter as well you mm. have met my mother uh, who inspired me to mm. be um, uh, you know to work with me i've run the women leadership program at iim bangalore mm. i've done numerous career guidance events for women mm. i have stood up and organized protests across bengaluru city right. when the ram sena attacked women mm. uh, and 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 i basically argued that no attacks on women no moral policing mm. i worked with youth on safety audits really? for women mm. when it comes to women related issues mm. i have a track record mm. my opponent mm. basically so to basically ask her ask her to the issues of yeah. women there is no compromise from your side absolutely that not the interest will always uh, and be you will never hear me making any kind of a sexist misogynistic statement that's not me you know glad to hear that as well mr rajiv goda and all that we can say is we wish you all the best for this journey as well and we will also go ahead and join you on your campaign trail as you go ahead and interact with the people and try to establish that base connect and what the people have to say about you as well all look forward best. to seeing you on the campaign trail